Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 19. There's something interesting in scripture I've noticed over the years. And that is before the resurrection and before Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the 120 in the prayer room, in the room they were praying in, before that, before the resurrection, before Pentecost, they were more afraid, they were hiding, they were confused, they didn't know what to do. But then when Jesus comes back to life, he says, wait for, wait for the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. So they wait 10 days, they're praying together, they're united in prayer, and then the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And from that day forward, after Pentecost, you see people of God who were once hiding, now they're courageous, who were confused and now everything's clear who was not afraid to be a witness. They were zealous for God's kingdom. They wanted to help people. They preached, they used their spiritual gifts. And I just wanna just say this, that that is still today, that before, before Christ, you may not have known all these things, but after you meet Christ, after you encounter him, you are empowered to do the work and to worship him in greater ways. And today I wanna to discuss that. I wanna talk about being spirit-empowered disciples according to our scripture. And I just wanna just say this too, and I have a little feedback on the mic if you guys don't mind bringing that, my volume down a little bit. I wanna say this, that in the world we're living in, we need the help of the Holy Spirit in greater measure. And for me personally, I have needed the Holy Spirit to help me. In fact, it was the Holy Spirit that warned me of things to come in times of my life, and I saw them coming. Now, my, that mic would have went down a little bit too much. I don't know. Are you okay? <laughs> and then there's been times where the Lord has given me a word for someone, a divine word for someone, a word of knowledge, as the, as the spiritual gifts say in 1 Corinthians 12, a word of knowledge, and it was exactly what someone needed to hear, but they never told me about it. And that God used to reassure that person that God hears their prayers, amen? So God has warned me of things. God has given me words about uh, people that they needed to hear, to encourage them, to strengthen, to edify, to build them up. Even sometimes to help them take a different direction because they were going the wrong way. God can use all the gifts, amen? And we need the help of the Holy Spirit because we're coming against spiritual powers and principalities of this world that take spiritual answers and remedies that we as humans can't do without the help of the Holy Spirit. Are you following me on that? And the disciples knew that and the disciples experienced the power of the Holy Spirit with them. Now, what we see here is Paul is going to be on his third missionary journey and he's gonna visit Ephesus and he finds believers in Christ, disciples. They are disciples, they are followers of Christ. Um, it's a little tricky here in this scripture, but I'm gonna help explain it as much as I can. But he addresses them as disciples or in my translation, believers. So they were saved, but they still needed discipleship on a few things. So let's go to Acts chapter 19. I'm gonna read uh, seven verses and I'm gonna teach that and then we'll close. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers, maybe your version says disciples. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience? He asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would, who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Wow, interesting, isn't it? 
I thought that was interesting, interesting, right? <laughs> Let me explain. This is, this is a very fascinating scripture. It's the last time that tongues is addressed in scripture, that baptism of the Holy Spirit is addressed. This, addressed. this is another experience. It's the fourth experience in the book of Acts where people were baptized in the Holy Spirit with some physical sign of evidence. And in this case, they, they spoke and prophesied. They spoke in tongues and they prophesied about the Lord. He comes to this Ephesus and he finds 12 men who had been discipled, uh, most likely by someone down the line that followed John the Baptist. And we don't know how they were discipled. We don't know how they came to be believers in Christ. And they had not even been water baptized yet. When we see here, uh, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? There's a lot of different ways of looking at this, but in the Greek, it was basically this. And just remember that Luke is given a quick summary of what happened with this encounter in seven verses. This, this encounter could have been days, or this encounter could have been a whole day of teaching and maybe other days of coming together and then him praying over them. Just remember in seven verses, Luke has only given us what we really need to see. So he didn't give all the details of everything that was said and spoken of. But when he says, did you receive when you believed, what he's referring to is, after you believed in Jesus Christ, did you experience the baptism or receiving or filling of the Holy Spirit? And they say, well, we didn't even, we didn't even know there is a Holy Spirit. This has baffled historians and biblical scholars, and they believe that the way it's rendered in all translations, it could be a little different, and it should be different in the Greek. It would be different in the Greek. Because here's why. These men obviously knew the baptism of John. They must have known the Old Testament scriptures. And John himself talked about the Holy Spirit as well. So they, knew, they knew about the Holy Spirit, but they did not know about the experience of receiving or being baptized in the Holy Spirit for power. So in other words, Paul is not questioning, are you even believers? Have you even received the Holy Spirit upon salvation? Let me explain that. Paul is not questioning that. Because Ephesians 1.13 says this, and when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. It's not when you were baptized in Christ, it's when you believed in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. When, the, when you believe, when you believed in Jesus Christ one day, immediately the Holy Spirit came upon you or in you and dwelt in you to identify you as a child of God, amen? amen. Praise God for that. He cleansed you, he made you holy, he made you acceptable in God's sight as scriptures teach us. That is the identification of a believer. We have that from the Holy Spirit. He identifies us as a child of God according to Ephesians 1.13. What about 2 Corinthians 1.21? This is also Paul. He says, now it is God who establishes both us and you in Christ. He anointed us, placed his seal on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a pledge of what is to come. Through salvation, the Holy Spirit is placed in your hearts because he's marking you as a believer through the Holy Spirit. One person put it this way, the indwelling comes before the infilling. So the Holy Spirit dwells in you first at salvation and then he wants to fill you with greater measure and power through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let me explain that more by using scripture, Acts 1 four through five, you remember this story in the beginning. And this is Paul. Paul wasn't checking to see if they were saved. He was checking to see if they had experienced what they experienced, what the, what the disciples first experienced at Pentecost, what, what the church, um, uh, or Cornelius' household experienced, what other believers experienced is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So he's checking on that. Let's look back at Acts one, four through five. Once when he was eating with them, this is Jesus, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. This wasn't the gift of salvation. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? Do you see the delineation? This was not about salvation. This was about something else, subsequent or after or around salvation. By the way, some people believe in Jesus Christ and immediately they get baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Some people are believers of Christ, water baptized, and have never experienced the baptism or the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit yet. 
This is why I'm here to help teach that and to help bring that into our hearts and to be open to this. Uh, we, we as a church at Calvary, we're very diverse in our backgrounds of faith. Many have come from different denominations. Many are just brand new believers or young believers in the faith. They never were taught about the Holy Spirit, kind of like these gentlemen. They needed more understanding of, of what Paul was talking about. And so as a pastor and as the apostle Paul did, we help people understand everything that Jesus commanded and told us to do and to receive. Amen. And so that's why I'm here. And I would ask you to search this yourself and all those things. But I would ask you to open your heart to what the word of God says so we can understand and receive what he has promised us. This was a promise from Jesus. It was a gift of the presence of the Holy Spirit in greater measure. Look at Acts 1.8. He says this, this is what Jesus said to them. But you will receive power, not you will receive salvation. Not that you will receive the Holy Spirit for the first time, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. So it's not, and then you'll be saved. It's you will be my witnesses. I just want to show you this is proof text. Telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus is saying, wait for me, uh, for the gift I have promised from me, from God. He will come upon you to give you power to be witnesses, not for salvation. This is another experience in the journey with God. Are we seeing that? Okay. By the way, just, just so you know too, that we can be filled again and again, a refilling, a refreshing of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now the 12 disciples were unaware of this baptism of the Holy Spirit. It looks like they're saying we're, we didn't even know about the Holy Spirit. Biblical historians go, that's impossible. The Old Testament talks about the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist talked about the Holy Spirit. I'm just gonna reiterate that. So most likely Luke left out some of the conversation that this was about the baptism and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. But he doesn't just stop at that. He actually checks on them and goes, what baptism did you get? And the baptism that they had was the baptism of John. Do you, everyone remembers this one before Jesus came on the scene. John was preparing the way for the Messiah. And so he was baptizing people in water for repentance of their sin to prepare their hearts to receive Jesus Christ. This is why some people may even argue that Paul wasn't actually talking to believers in Christ because maybe they only knew about just John's baptism only and had not truly believed in Jesus Christ yet. The problem with that interpretation of this is every time in the book of Acts, whenever the word believer or disciple is used, uh, the, Luke, the author is saying that they already believed in Jesus Christ. So biblical, biblical uh, scholars, theologians, and historians go, he was talking to people who believed in Christ, but they, were, they stopped at the baptism of John. They did not have the water baptism yet. We're about to have a water baptism come up. And the reason why we get water baptized is to identify and public, publicly identify and publicly confess before everyone is present and the Lord that we are followers of Jesus Christ. This baptism is a cleansing, so to say, metaphorically symbolic of what already took place spiritually. Your old man has been washed away, your old person's washed away, and now you're a new creation in Christ when you come out of that water. You've identified with, with dying to your old life and coming out, and now you're a new person. That's already happened to you spiritually. What we do through water baptism is we demonstrate that physically before God and before everyone else. Back then, this was radical because persecution was intense. So when they did this out in public, they were like, oh, it must be those people from the way, the believers. It was a little more risky to do it, but they did it with boldness and courage. Today, we're in a safe company. We can do that. But some of you may feel a little apprehension of de declaring Jesus as your Lord and Savior in front of your family and friends. I would say, I would say do not be ashamed of Jesus Christ. <laughs> He's not ashamed of you. He loves you. He died for you on the cross. And the, the, the word actually warns us not to be ashamed of him or he will be ashamed of us before his father. If we deny him, he would deny us. So I can tell you right now, if you're not ashamed, he's not ashamed. He's not denying you. He's accepting you. He's receiving you. 
Be bold. Declare your faith in front of everyone. Don't be afraid of that. All right, so with that said, a little plug. There's a water baptism coming up, okay? It's on our next test page on our website. They, these were discipleship moments that Paul was taking these 12 men through. Why is he doing this? He's preparing them for ministry. He's preparing them to help them be effective witnesses in this area. He wants Ephesus to thrive. By the way, we find out that Paul stays in Ephesus for nearly two years. So he's going to spend a lot of time here and do ministry and work. But right now, uh, he's helping these men take every step necessary. And he doesn't stop at water baptism. He simply wants to pray for them now to help them to go out and be witnesses. And what happens? As he's praying for them, the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they begin to pray in a language they do not know or a heavenly language, a language of angels. We have two examples of that. We have um, Acts 2 where the people heard their language and they knew that the people praying in this language, they did not know it. But they heard it and they said, how are they speaking our language? There was many nations present for the Passover in Acts 2. So they're hearing them speak their language and yet they've never learned it. That's what it means to pray in other tongues. But 1 Corinthians 13, 1 refers to the tongues of angels. So that's a language no one knows. Earlier at the nine o'clock, Pastor Arya um, presented something that was so important and powerful. When, when, when we run out of words to worship God with, all we can do is like give our lives, right? God, God is so great. What else can we say? There's nothing else we can say. We know what's interesting. When we, when we are baptized or are begin to praise and worship God in tongues, it's like the words have run out in English. Now God is magnified through the Holy Spirit. He's worshiped through the Holy Spirit. It also says they prophesied. So most likely they were proclaiming things about God. That's the same thing that happened in Acts 2. They pray in language they did not know, but other people recognize it. Sometimes that's not what happens in real life, even today. People don't know what the language is. And so if it's spoken out loud in front of the entire church, someone with the gift of interpretation is meant to interpret that message so we all can understand. That's 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, all those lessons. So when we don't understand the language and it's a word for the whole church, we're meant to have an interpretation. But we can also pray privately in tongues out of worship of God and interceding for others and being in his presence the Holy Spirit can come upon you and you will begin to pray in a language you do not know. Don't be shocked by it. Don't be afraid by it. Once, once it happens to you, you will love it. I don't know if anyone else here has experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it's powerful. I, know, I mean, I know there is. I know they're in this room. When the Holy Spirit first came over me, what came out of my mouth was obviously praise and worship to the Lord. If, if I was saying something I didn't know, it didn't matter. I felt the presence of God in such a powerful way. I felt the joy, the peace, the love, the confidence, the security of knowing that my God is there and he loves me. It was powerful. The first time that I was baptized, I was at college. I had actually just finished the study of the book of Acts with my professor on Thursday nights from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Sounds fun, right? And it was great because I really got a lot of better understanding. And that's why I want to give you understanding today. It really helped me, you know, get some of the, the wrong teachings and maybe things that have been said over the past or different things that people say about this or that. And I began to take this journey through the book of Acts and I saw that this was meant for today. I was not in ministry yet. I, it was my senior year at college, studying to be a pastor. And after this class one night, I don't even think we were done yet with the class. Um, not, I wasn't playing hooky or skipping class. I mean, we had more classes to go still. <laughs> Just so you know, mom and dad, I went to the class. <laughs> I went to the chapel of the school to pray. I said, all right, God, I get it. And I'm more open now than ever. 
If, if you have more for me, I want it. And what I wanted was the Holy Spirit, his help, his power. And you've heard me say this story before, but we have so many new people here. I'm in there and I'm praying. I'm asking God, this is my posture. God, I need your help to be a pastor. I didn't know this till after because I went and asked him, but a gentleman was in the library and he said, he's a spirit-filled man, spirit-filled student, also baptized in the Holy Spirit, experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit after salvation. And he was in the, the library studying. He said, the Lord put on his heart to go play the piano in the chapel. I needed a little help. (laughs) I like music when I pray. I like music when I study, uh, particularly instrumental music, just to help me focus. And the Lord knew that. And I'm in the back row of the chapel and I'm, I'm really just crying out to God saying, prepare me, mold me, shape me to be who I need to be. And as I'm praying, I hear this music play and I just get completely wrecked by the Holy Spirit in a good way. He came upon me in such a powerful way. I'm crying. I'm seeing uh, visions of me preaching to people as I pray. And I'm praying in a language I do not know. In that moment, do you think I wanted to stop? No. There was no one there telling me what to do. There was nothing like that. It was simply me and God in fellowship, in prayer and worship. It was me surrendering my life to God. And that's when he came upon me. And from that day forward, I have continued to have a prayer life where I pray in this heavenly language or another language uh, in tongues. And I've even prophesied for the Lord and given prophetic words for people or things like that. And it's been an incredible growth experience for me. Just so you know, you're not better than someone if you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. It is common, by the way, for many, for the majority of the church, majority of Christians believe in Jesus Christ, they've been water baptized, but they have not had that experience that I'm talking about where they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And going back to the different denominations and upbringing, a lot of it has to, this is the number one thing I hear. My pastor at my old church never talked about the Holy Spirit. It was always God and Jesus, but I never heard Holy Spirit. Francis Chan has a great book about that. It's called The Forgotten God. It's the Holy Spirit has been left out of services. That's why when you come to Calvary, we're praying and we pray that you experience the presence of the Holy Spirit. We pray you experience the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I want all of God and everything he asks or promises us and ask of us too. I haven't looked at my notes in a long time. Let me, uh, (laughs) what's the reason? I think this is important. This is the most important thing. The reason is, and the purpose for experiencing this, and why why would Paul pray over them and, and make sure this is happening? Why was this a question that he brought forward? Why was it in, in other places, in, in Acts 10, or Acts 8, or Acts 2? Because the worship and the work of God's church. When we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, I believe our worship is strengthened. Because that's what they did. They worshiped God. It refines our worship too. And when we run out of words, we continue to worship God. Doesn't God deserve eternal praise and glory? Yeah. Amen. By the way, it was beautiful worship here today. Beautiful. It sounded like an, just a host of angels singing in here. And God deserves all of that. And we're worshiping him, no one else. Amen. The other thing is, is work. The work that we have to do for the church, the Holy Spirit comes to equip us for missional effectiveness is what I call it. To be missionally effective And I'm not saying that you're not effective if you have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's not what I'm implying. What I am saying, though, is is that there's more power, more help, the presence of God to help us to be even greater, to be a greater and effective witness for him. Amen? In greater measure. 
I have witnessed this, I have experienced this in my life. There are times where there's something that has to happen in the spiritual realm, rather like music playing. <laughs> so, were you in heaven all of a sudden? <laughs> yeah. That was funny. There's, there's things that have to happen in the spiritual realm and the Holy Spirit helps you do that. I can tell you right now, I, I, can't, I can't face, when I have people come to me for help or I go see people that need Jesus, there are things that I cannot accomplish on my own power. I need the help of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's always there for us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Jesus said that in John 14 through 16. So he's there for you even if you are not baptized in the Holy Spirit yet or have experienced this. And by the way, we need that experience more and more. We don't need it just one time. But we're humans. This is a weird way of saying this, but we drain, so to say, strength and energy. You know what I'm talking about? Like life can beat you up. You can, I have witnessed to people, I have ministered to people and after I'm done, I'm drained physically, emotionally and spiritually and I need to go refill. And it's not just my social battery where I need a break from people, okay? I like people, I like to people, I like to be with people. I do need my breaks. But you can feel the, the fight spiritually when you're doing ministry with people. And you need to be refilled. So anyway, I mean, let me move forward. The, the reason why is because we're meant to be witnesses for the Lord and he has given us power through the Holy Spirit to be effective. So I wanna give you four things to consider how we receive the Holy Spirit. And then we're gonna close. And I wanna encourage you to come Wednesday night. We're gonna spend time in prayer. I realize we have a conf conflict of, of different events because of the weather last um, uh, Wednesday night. It, it was like you were living on the surface of the sun out in our back parking lot. Last Wednesday, it was so hot with the, with the um, black top back there. So I wanna encourage you to come out to prayer night. We're gonna spend more time just to hang out in the presence of the Lord and, and apply this. But I wanna encourage you to apply this starting today, starting tomorrow. Get alone with God, amen? Number one, here's, here's it is. How do we receive the feeling of baptism of the Holy Spirit? Remember this, it is, it, this experience of the presence of the Holy Spirit is a gift from God, okay? And one, first of all, as believers, you can receive this. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, this wouldn't even be on your radar, would it? You wouldn't have the spirit in you to, to long for more of God. So number one, we approach God with faith and we ask. We put our faith in the scripture that says God gives his spirit to those who ask. That's Luke eleven thirteen. 13. Now that you're aware that there is a Holy Spirit and that there is a baptism or filling of the Holy Spirit, now you know that you can ask by faith to receive this gift. And I believe desire and faith are factors for receiving. There has to be a desire for more of God. There, there needs to be a faith that you believe this is an experience that you can have. Secondly, we surrender time to seek after God. I believe availability and pursuit are factors for receiving. Let me just illustrate that for a moment. Let's say this represents, sorry, let's say this represents your life. And God is in the spiritual realm wanting to pour his, his spirit upon you as even Paul uses these words, or as uh, Luke uses these words in our scripture today, the spirit was poured out upon them. And He's ready to pour out this, this picture of the Holy Spirit, so to say. But we're just so busy doing life and going about everywhere we go. And I've done this before, you remember maybe, that you know, I got this to do, I got this to do. I, I gotta hurry up and get going. Before I go to bed, uh, you know, I, I kinda wanna watch that show. All these things are happening, right? And God's just like, hey, look, as soon as you slow down and make yourself available, then we'll, then we'll have an experience. And sometimes, you know, the opening's even smaller because we haven't made room for God. And so I just want to encourage us to come to God with like a big bucket. Foster that, cultivate that. What do I mean by that? 
longer periods with God in prayer and worship in the word. Like he can't miss. And he doesn't miss, by the way. And you're, you're there because he's not going to, here's the thing, he's not going to rush that. And he's a gentleman. And he wants to give you this gift, but we have to slow down enough to want it. Thirdly, we surrender our hearts to be filled with God. There has to be this, and I believe, a vulnerability with God and not being self-conscious of what others think. I believe these are factors in receiving the Holy Spirit. A vulnerability that, you know what, God, I'm not gonna worry about what everyone else thinks because I'm in this service right now and I want to be filled even more. I want everything you offer me. Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Help me to be a powerful witness for you. And, and you're vulnerable before the Lord and you're not worried about everyone else around you. Can I also encourage us when we come to prayer nights or, or we're praying in, in service and worshiping, I'm not saying forget everyone around you like the whole time, but like what if we just tuned out everyone else and it was just you and God and not worry what everyone else around you is gonna say or think. It's powerful what happens. Sometimes I close my eyes and worship and I, I envision God on the throne and I envision him standing up with his arms out to me and we're hanging out together. And I forget, no offense, I forget that you're here. And then sometimes I, I do remember because I have to be mindful as a shepherd what's going on in the sanctuary, just so you know. And so I had to balance that. So that's why on Sundays for me, I, I, Sundays is not enough. I have to spend time with God all week. I have to spend time with God all week to experience this. I surrender my heart. I'm willing to be vulnerable before him and receive whatever he has. And lastly, we surrender our lives to be used by God. Notice the theme of surrender. There has to be this cooperation. I've, I see that as a factor that you wanna be in relationship with God. You want more of God. You're willing to slow down to spend time with him. You don't have your guard up as much. You're more vulnerable. And as soon as we do that, his spirit is just whew, pours on us. We're not worried what, you know, people are gonna think in our family when we tell them. I have story after story, by the way, of people telling me, Ryan, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I pray in language I didn't know. That was the evidence I knew right then and there. But it was what I felt that was so powerful. It was what I saw when I was praying. And I don't know what to tell my family because my family taught against this our entire lives. They, let, they didn't worry about that. You know what they worried about most of all? You know what they cared about most of all? Is pursuing God. And if God's word talks about it, then it must be true. But we surrender our lives to be used by God. I believe the need or necessity for God's help and power to be witnesses are factors. He wants to give you more of his spirit, his power, his help, because you've surrendered your lives to serve him. This is the reoccurring theme. It's even the theme in this scripture today. We see it over and over again in Acts. But these disciples were willing to serve and follow Jesus. They decided to be water baptized. Paul just does what he does. He prays for them to be ready for that, to go out and be witnesses. And when he prays for them, they are baptized in the Holy Spirit and they pray in tongues and prophesy. They were willing to give their lives to serve God. That looks like factors to me as well. Amen? I'm gonna stand together in prayer. And if you can, stand. It's okay if you can't. I wanna encourage you to join us in fasting this, this week. Um, we start on Tuesday night, go into Wednesday night, or attend our prayer night. If families, if you're going to hang out at the family thing, that's great, no worries, enjoy that. Get to know what's going on for your kids. I wanna just bear my heart with you real quick. Um, the Bible says they carry each other's burdens, right? And so I just need a little, we need a little help as a church. Um, I just wanna also have you help me in prayer on this. And, 
it's um, a burden we have, and it came up this week, but we, we, we're seeing an increase of needs in our community and even in our church, physical needs like housing issues, uh, food, um, the future of people, it's scary. They don't know where to go. They don't know where to live. They can't, you know, they, they, there's health complications with them being able to get jobs. There's some legitimate concerns and needs. And this week we um, took care of quite a few needs. We're, we have family members, members of our church in hotels right now because they were sleeping in vans. Um, we also found out this week that um, they've been great partners, Delaware Food Bank, that they are no longer able to provide free food to us. So we will have to pay for any food we give uh, families and individuals that come to our church. We've been helping over 70 people a week or more. Um, so now it's gonna be on us financially. And uh, just, just pray, because this, this problem is bigger than one church, right? And we, just, we need intervention in our community. It's gotten harder and harder for people to make it each day and every week. Uh, we're looking for places for people to live. Our, our list is so long, it's, it's not good. Um, housing is an issue. And obviously uh, finances to eat is an issue. And so um, thank you for your, your giving. And I just want you to know as a pastor, as uh, I speak for Margaret, our benevolence director, um, who literally just got done teaching a money conference to help people be good stewards of their money. That's what we do here. We teach people to recover and get back on their feet and everything. Um, and the board, we make decisions uh, carefully because we know that you are investing and that you also have your own needs and you're giving to the church. You're investing in what we do. And so we're careful what we do with the finances, okay? And I just wanna let you know though, the need is great in our community. And there are times where we don't have enough funding or we don't have enough food. And now that Delaware Food Bank doesn't have the funding to continue to give us free stuff, they're gonna continue to work with us. Now the burden will be on us as well. But that's okay because God will provide. God will provide. And that's what God was speaking to me about because while we were worshiping, I was praying for these needs and God kept saying, I'm bigger than those needs you're praying about right now. I'm greater than those needs. And together as a church though, we are the hands and feet. We are the ones who help make this happen. So uh, just be in prayer for us as we, as we move forward in helping people. Thank you for your giving. It means a lot, it helps a lot. And just so you know, it's difficult, it's gonna be difficult now and we're not even in the winter months yet where it gets really bad. We need to pray for this community and we need leadership and community leaders to come together and figure out the problems. It's not good, all right? Just real talk from people who are seeing it, from us as a church who help involved, there needs to be um, intervention and so let's pray for the wisdom and the guidance as well of our community leaders. But we as a church, we're gonna to continue to do stuff about it. We're gonna to continue to be the hands and feet. We're not gonna stop. We're gonna just push forward and go forward and watch God provide. Amen? Amen. Amen. We have faith. So, all right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, <clears throat> that you are greater. How great is our God. And greatly to be praised. In the midst of our own struggles, our midst of our own pain, our problems, you are worthy of praise. God, you see the remedies needed in this community. It, it begins with the heart of mankind, a change of heart. And Lord, the physical needs that need to take place, the provisions there. God, we ask you to provide both. God, we pray for a revival of the heart and revival of people's needs. Lord, lead and guide us as a church the partnerships needed, Lord. We thank you, God, for the Delaware Food Bank. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing they've been. But Lord, we are not gonna be reliant on those programs. We're gonna rely on you. And God, we thank you that we have even more from you, the power of the Holy Spirit. And God, even in this need, we need discernment from the Holy Spirit. We need the gift of discernment on how to handle every need. And Lord, I pray that you would give us that. I ask that, Lord. 
I ask God that you would open the floodgates of heaven, Lord, for the finances and the homes and the places, the programs. Lord, I pray that we would find ways to help the homeless and for all those who are becoming homeless, Lord. For those who are living in their vans and the sides of the streets, Lord. Nowhere to go, Lord. We pray you provide. God, give us discernment and wisdom on how to handle these situations. And Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to come and fill us. Your word shows us that. It illustrates it. It teaches it. It teaches this powerful experience. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would come. Meet us tonight. Meet us tomorrow. Meet us on our prayer night. Lord, come and fill this place. When we come next week, God, I pray you'd fill us even while we're worshiping. Give us more of you, God. Help us to surrender all these things I mentioned today, Lord. Help us to be vulnerable before you to receive all that you have for us. And we thank you, God, that you are faithful and trustworthy and you will take care of all of our needs. We give you all the glory and praise for what you're gonna do. And we thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.